So, uh, I last gave this talk, I think it was around about 2016. I'd been doing PRP injections for a few years. I thought it was worthwhile presenting some research that uh, one of our fellows had done for us. Uh, and I felt after seven years and reading some of your comments last year that it was time to go back and revisit this. Um, and I guess the, the key points I'm going to say today are really what, what's changed, what stayed the same, and what's been my experience now of almost 11 years of performing PRP injections noting that we know n equals 1 is not science. So a little bit of an overline. We'll just go through some basic science. We'll talk a little bit about PRP preparation, some of the literature, outcome measures, and also some information for your patients. So the conditions that we'll treat with PRP include tendinopathy, which, as you know, is a degenerative condition with breakdown uh, of the collagen of the tendons, and we all know frustrating, very long time frames for improvement. Uh, osteoarthritis, degeneration of the, uh, the lining cartilage in the knees, which is obviously progressive, um, often ending up with our orthopaedic colleagues. And I'll also mention one case on muscle injury, which sometimes gets a little bit overlooked, but I think there can really be a role for PRP, particularly in chronic muscle injury. So from a historical perspective, when I started in sports medicine about 25 years ago, our standard conservative treatment was everything we do today, rest, ice, unload, medications, anti-inflammatories, we get the physiotherapists involved, start some rehabilitation manual therapy, and in a lot of cases, consider an injection therapy. And back at that time, cortisone was the main one, and over the years, like a lot of my colleagues, I've done a lot of cortisone injections, and they certainly help in many cases. Over the years, other substances have put their hand up. Does anyone remember polydocanol or aprotonin? So they, they came and went. Uh, when that paradigm didn't work, then usually the last step was either put up with it or go see the surgeons for an operation. We know for tendinopathy, operations are not always successful, and a joint arth arthroplasty is a big undertaking. So is there any other way that we could treat in that middle ground? And we come now to the role of biological therapy. Now, this first came to my attention probably the late 2000s, um, when I was working over at Hurstville and Jerome Goldberg sticks his head through the door and says, oh, I've had this rotten tennis elbow and I haven't been able to operate and I've had a few cortisones and it sort of makes it better for a few weeks and then it's come back and it's really bugging me. And Duron told me about this paper that was written about just injecting some blood around the tendons. And he said, I've done it, my pain's gone away, I'm really happy and you guys should be doing it. And of course, if Jerome tells you you should be doing something, generally you should listen. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna take this on. So initially, for a, probably about two or three years, I was just doing autologous blood injections. So take the blood straight away before it clots, inject it back into the tendon and see what happens. And to my not necessarily surprise, it actually worked quite well. Um, and is there a way that we could do this a little bit better? And this is the, the logical extension came with PRP. So what PRP involves is trying to maximise what we feel is in the blood that is stimulating a healing response, and we feel that's probably the platelets. So as, by definition, PRP is any volume of blood with a, a platelet count greater than baseline. Um, and as Ivan mentioned earlier on, possibly a treatment looking for, for some avenue to be used because it has been used in many, many areas of medicine for quite a long time. The basic principle is that we remove the part of the blood that we don't need, which is predominantly the red cells, which make up about 45% of the blood, and then concentrate the parts we do need, which are the platelets and also the leukocytes, which I'll mention in a little bit. So Ivan's already covered a lot of this for me, so thank you, Ivan. Uh, tissue healing is regulated by all these growth proteins. In your platelets, you've got somewhere over 1,000 different, different proteins which will regulate the process of healing and repair. So what we're trying to do is introduce growth factors that may enhance tissue healing in compromised situations. Um, all these different granules, which you don't really need to know about with growth factors, the one that uh, the follicularly challenged in the room might like to know about is VEGF, which apparently stimulates hair growth. Um, myself and Ivan obviously haven't gone down that pathway. But really, we're trying to create uh, a, an acute inflammatory response so that we can then initiate a healing process in the tendon and we can actually enhance repair. Uh, there's many ways we can prepare PRP and, and when I go through the literature, I guess one of the main um, criticisms of PRP has been, yeah, but there's all these papers that suggest that it doesn't work. But what we also need to understand is there's many ways that you can, uh, uh, you can skin a cat with PRP preparation and that goes anywhere from simply taking some blood and putting in the test tube and spinning it for five minutes to actually using a commercial system with a two-spin uh, process which will actually give you a buffy coat, which I'll 
uh, described later on. Um, but the real goal is to maximise the platelet counts, but also I think the role of white cells, and, and I think that's one thing that has changed over the last few years, and particularly this meta-analysis by Jane Fitzpatrick from Melbourne, uh, who suggested and seems to have shown that the studies that used a buffy coat and had a higher, so leukocyte-rich preparation, were more effective than leukocyte-poor preparations for the treatment of tendinopathy. So that's a, a good paper to go and have a look at. Uh, now, I have to say um, farewell to the kit that I've used for the last nearly 11 years. I'm, I'm actually really, really disappointed about this, so I'm in the process of trialling out some new preparations. But uh, simply what it involves, you take the blood, blood goes in the central chamber, blood goes in the centrifuge. Um, in most of the Buffy code or commercial systems, it's a two-spin method, so they spin once to separate plasma from red cells, then they spin again to um, separate platelet-rich from platelet-poor preparation. And in this particular uh, system, uh, where's my space bar? The good stuff's um, right down the bottom, so we draw off the excess platelet uh, uh, plasma, and then we're left with about a 10% about a concentration of the blood, which we then put wherever we need to put it. Uh, so what's the evidence for PRP? Look, there are a lot of studies. Pick a body part and someone's probably done a study on PRP versus something. They're not all particularly high quality, but there are quite a few level one studies, and particularly for tennis elbow and also for gluteal uh, tendinopathy. And, and certainly I feel enough evidence to support uh, its use in musculoskeletal medicine. Uh, so Peer Booms uh, was one of the sort of seminal PRP papers, and he certainly showed PRP versus cortisone was a 75 as opposed to a 50% improvement, um, and actually followed his patients up for two years and showing that even at that time the PRP group did better than the cortisone. Um, some other tennis elbow studies, you know, PRP versus dry needling showed improvement, not quite as strong. A meta-analysis looking at, you know, there's at least four level one studies um, showing that as we all know, cortisone has a better initial therapeutic effect with relapse of symptoms, and PRP, whilst more painful at the start, produces a slower improvement. Uh, one other point out of this was that when the patients had been re-scanned in tennis elbow in one study is that the morphology of the tendon uh, had improved. Um, some soft studies for plantar fasciitis. Um, rotator cuff I've always found a little bit difficult because of the multiple potential sources of pain in the shoulder. Again, there are some studies showing PRP more effective than cortisone uh, in the medium to long term. Uh, I think if you go and look at any series of papers, and a, a, a plug for Australian researchers, this is again Jane Fitzpatrick from down in Melbourne. She has done a PhD on the use of PRP in gluteal tendinopathy. It's very well um, researched. She's done follow-up out to two years. She had a crossover arm um, looking at the patients that failed cortisone who actually went on to PRP. So there's a few different studies that are worth looking at. Um, her initial study at three months was an 80% improvement in PRP as opposed to 50% in cortisone. Uh, and in the follow-up groups, out to two years, the PRP improvement maintained itself in almost all the patients. Uh, and in the patients in the cortisone group who failed and then crossed over, they had improvement when they had PRP injections. So I guess from that, it also suggests that having an initial cortisone doesn't preclude uh, PRP working. Uh, patella tendon I personally found to be very, very uh, beneficial for PRP injections. Uh, and then I guess we go into joint arthritis. And I, I remember Ivan, again, always telling me, well, you know, why should this work in knee arthritis? Um, I th my personal feeling is it probably does work as a biological anti-inflammatory. There are some in vivo studies to suggest a positive effect on cartilage and possibly chondrocyte proliferation. I won't stand up here and tell you that it uh, reverses or even slows the course of osteoarthritis, uh, but patients uh, will often get quite significant relief from the injection. Uh, again, few studies uh, looking at PRP. This is, I thought was a good study from Patel. It's a little bit of an older one, but looking at PRP as opposed to saline. And what I liked about this one was looking at a single as opposed to a, a, like a two-stage injection and showing that there was no real difference between doing one or two injections, and both of the PRP groups did better than normal saline, which deteriorated. Um, a lot of studies now as well comparing PRP to hyaluronic acid, and as a rule, most of the studies favoured PRP over HA. So what are the downsides? Um, 
Look, I think PRP is a, it's a generally a safe procedure. All you're doing is taking patient's blood and treating it and then re-injecting it back into a body part. Um, Post-injection pain is the worst thing and there are some areas where the pain is worse than others, particularly tennis elbow. They, they generally are not, not happy with me when they come back unless they've improved. Um, it's obviously not 100% successful, but what is? Um, and I'll present some of my figures over nearly 1,600 injections over that period of time. And I think for tendinopathy in general, about a 75% hit rate. And that's quite consistent with all of the literature that you would read. Um, so my experience I presented back in 2016, there was 350 cases. Uh, we'd had some good improvements uh, overall. Uh, I think it was about two thirds and that included tendon and joint. Uh, this is some of the work John Malloy did for me, my registrar who's now in New Zealand. Um, I, I like the last point there, work cover patients who we generally expect to do uh, not as well. Three quarters of them had improved with PRP injections. Uh, and there were the conditions that we treated. Gluteal tendon there was 60%, was which at the time I thought, oh, that, that's a little bit lower than I would have liked. Um, now, I've done now over 1,600 patients since I wrote this talk, nearly 300 tennis elbows and about 75% improvement, um, nearly 200 gluteal tendons and heating above 80% improvement on those, so the, those numbers picked up. Uh, and realistically, most tendinopathies, we have done PRP for them. Uh, and with fairly similar effects overall. So I think you could safely say to your patient, look, this is a treatment alternative we have. It has a three out of four chance of making you better than you are. Um, and it has really little in the way of downside or side effect other than some post-injection pain. So it's, it's worth considering. Um, I'd like to talk about the Negrin effect. And this is one thing I guess I have seen when we started doing PRP early on, the orthopedic surgeons were very um, you know, dismissive as, as they would be. Oh, there's no science, this doesn't work. And as time's gone by and we've seen improvements and there's been more science come out, John actually will send me quite a few patients, tib ants, tib posts, plantar fascias, to try this as a treatment. And I, I figure if we can get one of the most sceptical men on the planet on board, then it, it must have a, a positive effect. Um, so joints, I tell patients usually about 70% for my joints are... Uh, I've had quite a few glenohumeral OAs from, from Jerome. You know, some of them have been great, some not, not so good, but more again, more, more good than bad. Uh, so my experience of PRP, 52-year-old um, male, very average tennis player, awful technique, um, nine months of, of tennis elbow, which I sat on, watch and wait, which is what some people advocate, and I got a little bit sick of it after that time. I thought, well, I'm, I'm peddling this stuff, so I should really bite the bullet and have a go. So yes, I had a PRP injection for that. I had moderate post-injection pain, so it was, it was pretty sore for a night, but not too bad after that. Um, it was much better within around about eight weeks and it took about three months for, I wouldn't say 100% resolution, but a much better resolution than what I had. And now I can hit a backhand without wincing. Uh, some case studies, and I'm just going to present two, two case studies which have always stuck out for me as patients. The first one was actually the, the husband of one of our local physiotherapists, and he's a young guy, 31. Uh, ACLs in his teens, multiple scopes. He'd actually had bilateral high tibial osteotomies, which didn't help him. Uh, chronic knee pain, uh, couldn't exercise, was a little bit overweight, um, and was a bit miserable, really. Uh, and we saw him first in July 20, uh, a single PRP injection into both knees. Uh, and within three months, he'd noticed a substantial improvement in his pain to a point where he was actually back exercising, doing some better rehab, uh, and had started to lose a bit of weight. Um, in his case, we repeated the injection at three months because he'd done so well, but he wanted to be better if he could. Uh, and I now see him every 12 months. I think we're up to our fifth injection. So. Where that fits in, I mean, you don't want to do a knee replacement on a 31-year-old guy, and he was heading down a slippery slope to, you know, obesity and reduced activity. Um, and if we can buy him 10 years with PRP injections, or if we can buy him pain relief so he can actually do some training, um, then that's a great outcome. Uh, the other one is a lady who came to me, um, a, a sort of a 30-year-old baseballer, and she'd had an acute medial head of gastrocnemius strain five months before she saw me. 
And she'd done everything right, physio, rehab, and, you know, hadn't pushed it, and she just still had pain. It just was not getting better. Uh, and she had an MRI scan just prior to seeing me, um, and you can see here that she just has this really awful chronic-looking tear of the central tendon of the medial head of gastrocnemius, and that was five months post-injury. Um, so I said, look, this is a great case for, for PRP. So we said, yeah, let's go ahead and do it. That's her six-week scan. Uh, and you can see already that the tendon, which was looking quite thick and irregular, has started almost to normalise there, and all the surrounding edema has gone away. Uh, in her case, she was about 50% better when I saw her at six weeks with the scan, and we thought, thought it would be a reasonable option to repeat the PRP injection, which we did. Uh, I saw her about six weeks after that. She was doing really well. She was rehabbing. She had no pain. She hadn't returned to baseball, but I haven't seen her back yet, so uh, I would assume that she's doing quite well. Uh, so I don't routinely rescan patients, but I think it's really interesting to show that in such a short period of time, the positive effects that may occur with the PRP injection. Uh, so my take-home message is uh, largely our PRP is a biologic treatment that offers us an alternate to our standard treatment options from conservative to surgical. It sits really nicely in that middle ground. Um, it has a very good theoretical basis for treating chronic tendinopathy and potentially osteoarthritis. Uh, the literature can at some times be conflicting, but I do believe there's sufficient in evidence, and particularly more recently with high quality randomised controlled trials to support its use. Um, my personal experience, N equal one, uh, is that over 10 years of doing this, that I've certainly had more positive effects than um, negative, and I've not had one patient that I know of that was worse afterwards. Um, and post-injection pain is the, is the main side effect. Uh, and I'll say Vale to Haver, Harvest and we'll be moving on to hopefully brighter and better systems. Thank you.